doing this presentation um, with my dear colleague in London, a bit wet in London today, apparently, but very uh, full of water and uh, gloomy skies. And I'm uh, in Perth where it's fairly sunny, a little bit warm, and uh, had some burning off. So we've got lots of smoke all over the place and all that to see, but similar to Indonesia north of us. Anyway, what I want to do in this little presentation is give you a quick rundown on my perspective of troubleshooting PLCs. And obviously, we've got a whole heap of associated materials we'll give away, which you'll get as well. It's actually about four chapters from our books. So that's it for me. <laughs> I was going to pass on to Carol just to confirm she can hear me OK. There will be problems with the internet. If your internet drops out, don't worry. We have a full recording of the session. So you will get a full recording. If I drop out, I'll pop back like a bad smell very quickly. So just to confirm with Auntie Carol, that is all well. Over to you, Carol. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear, Steve. So I think we're all ready to go. OK, thanks very much, Carol. Um, let's, I just want to welcome you guys from all over the world. Um, we've, normally, we've got about 600 people requested the um, recording, so um, there's quite a few odds and sods. Um, just to quickly run through some of the basics, we obviously want to make it a non-sales presentation. We run these uh, presentations every few weeks um, and obviously try and make it um, as interesting as possible. I'll keep it short to 30 minutes. There's a recording and, as I said, lots of extra materials, which will keep you busy for many hours afterwards. And hopefully I can just focus on the key areas of troubleshooting. We also, this is a bit of an advert here, we also um, have online video courses which give 10 or 15 hours worth of materials relating to particular topics such as troubleshooting PLCs and um, self-paced. But that's obviously the reason why I'm presenting this is to try and give you a bit of a feeling for what we do. Um, the objectives of this little presentation are um, to quickly give you some suggestions about troubleshooting PLC inputs and outputs. So I'll quickly go through what a PLC is, and then I'll go into some of the details. Talking, talking about troubleshooting PLC software. And then I really just want to also talk about some of the data communication issues uh, when you link up with your SCADA system. So I just want to look at the SCADA system as well. As I said, all encapsulated into 30 minutes. Anyone who uh, works in this area may say, Steve, it'll take hours and hours to run through this. And you're quite right. That's why we give you a lot of supporting extra information. So quick introduction to the PLC. Internal, external problems. Um, just want to really talk about those as far as IO is concerned. And then I just want to talk about SCADA troubleshooting, mainly from the perspective of the communication interface. Communication is really important. In fact, I was quite amused in the industrial automation industry. We've spent probably the last 20 years debating what communication standard to use. So, for example, Profibus, um, Foundation Field Bus, Ethernet with TCP IP. And then you have a whole slew of uh, protocols such as Data Highway Plus or DH485 from Rockwell Automation and Modbus. Um, and I noticed the rail industry in Europe is now just getting together to try and standardize on a protocol for signaling. You know, the critical thing with signaling is obviously interlocking. So the theme of connectivity is with us. And you all probably would have heard a big buzzword, which I'm trying to understand at the moment, which is Internet of Things, IoT which is a big growth area. And I believe it's nothing more than saying sense of communications. So really, why should you bother about this presentation? Very simply, if you can uh, get a handle on the um, idea of troubleshooting, you're ahead of all your peers. So really troubleshooting PLCs can be very simple all the way to very complex. So I want to look at it just generically and hopefully um, get you guys fired up. So if you can obviously troubleshoot effectively, you will be ahead of your peers. Um, Carol, if you can just shout, give me a little text every now and again, a little heartbeat, should we say, 
a little text heartbeat to say, hello, Steve, I can still hear you. It's all going well. I haven't dropped out. So uh, we've already got Osama there who doesn't hear. I hear nothing. Osama, um, I would like to speak, but Carol, Carol, can I ask you to talk to Osama by the text and um, take on there? Um, one of the problems with this, these presentations is if you don't have um, the correct browser, which in this case is good old Chrome, which isn't probably the best, but it's a very open standard, or Firefox, you will have a few problems. Unfortunately, Internet Explorer doesn't support HTML5, which is very unfortunate, but that's Microsoft. Um, so just quickly, uh, introduction to the PLC. Um, it means a programmable logic controller. And obviously, um, you have a PLC, which is the critical building block of all industrial automation stuff. So it does relay switching in a whole string of tasks here. And probably the best way of talking about the PLC is actually have a look at a particular example of a PLC. It has a block diagram of a PLC. Um, this is the inputs, switches, and these are the outputs. And obviously, Within here, you should see a program, generally a ladder logic program. So that's probably the critical um, critical thing. And obviously, memory and programming you use as well. So those are obviously the thing about the PLC. The PLC is obviously robust and hopefully idiot proof. It runs in very uh, harsh conditions. And obviously, the whole idea with the PLC is that you have program execution, and typically execution times are a few milliseconds down to a few microseconds. And the idea is that you read inputs and then you drive outputs. So, in essence, you have a ladder logic program, which looks like this sort of see a ladder logic program where you're executing uh, from the top to the bottom. And you have power flow going from left to right. So this is a typical example of one. This arguably is actually a little bit poorly put together because the stop push button should be normally open, but it's not. Um, um, the idea, I just want to avoid any confusion. It should be fail safe. Um, I'm not going to go into detail here, but for example, stop push button, I would normally indicate with a normally open contact like that, but I'm not going to dwell on that at the moment. I just want to say that we're using ladder logic programs. There is a standard called the 61131-3 standard where you have four or five other programming uh, languages as well. Um, and um, obviously very effective. But ladder logic is idiot proof, easy to use. So that's why we'll focus on this course here. So obviously the idea is that you have power flow and then you have what they call sealing of your contact on the second uh, execution second um, cycle and you can lock in your output and then when you push your stop button you break the power flow at this point and of course you then have um, your contact dropping out that's obviously a critical thing now what are the typical problems i don't want to i'm not going to spend time talking about how to write a program i'm really looking at your program problems this is a real mess of wires everywhere as you often see and uh, you can guess that some of the stuff is pretty old, uh, ranging from pretty new. So really, what are the typical problems that you can have with the PLC? Well, there's internal, external problems. So external are your field contacts, uh, digital inputs, and internal are obviously the PLC itself. PLCs are very robust. They are pretty idiot proof. They work really well. But external, you don't know what could be the problem. It could be a field input. It could be the cabling. It could be interference. So 80% of malfunctions estimated are I.O. modules external to the PLC. PLC itself is pretty well bulletproof. But the external environment is not bulletproof. Of course, sorts of things could happen. So 80% of your problems will occur externally. So whenever you walk to a PLC and someone says there's a problem, Always assume, until you're proven wrong, that it's something to do with the field wiring or the outputs. Something's gone wrong there. And let's face it, 
Um, PLCs are often in a nice, clean environment, but the field wiring is often in a filthy, industrial, horrible environment. So really, the problems generally relate to the I.O. modules. Sometimes, occasionally, you'll find an I.O. module has failed and you'll lose 16 inputs, for example, and I'll come back to that point, but that's very unlikely. You could get, if you do see large groups of failures, for example, you see um, eight inputs suddenly uh, disappear, or um, it shows that there's an open circuit condition, you'll often find it's due to a input card that has failed. But that's very unusual. But sometimes you can get a problem, for example, overheating of an input card um, due to the environment, and um, you could get an issue there. But as I said, 80% of failures are generally due to external things. So let's just quickly look at internal problems, which as I said, is about 20% of the PLC. Very unusual. I have actually, to be honest with you, I have less, my rather checkered career, have had problems with um, internal problems with PLCs and horrifying problems. I mean, one problem we had, we actually had, and I won't mention the name of the PLC, except to say it was a very prominent distributed control system manufacturer, decided to branch into PLCs and they rebranded a PLC from Germany. Uh, and what happened is actually the memory failed. Uh, memory got corrupted and we had horrible problems. Fortunately, we backed up the program, but major problems. And obviously, if you're running a plant, big problems. So one of the issues, obviously, uh, with internal problems is you've got to check your earthing grounding is correct. If that's not correct, you've got problems. And I'll come back to that point a little bit later when we talk about SCADA systems. Power supply is within the correct range. AC ripple. Batteries on the PLC are okay. Um, sometimes you've had the nasty problem where the battery's gone, power to the PLC is gone, and you've lost your program. Um, so those are some of the typical issues, and obviously you can examine internal diagnostics for uh, to see where there's a potential problem with the PLC. So external problems, which I just really want to talk about, and there's some subtle external problems actually, which are really very strange, and I'll talk about those. Obviously. First thing with external problems, check the power supply to the module. Look to see where the power to the digital input comes from. Fuses, breakers, have they gone? And obviously look for changes of voltage for the input. Make sure that there is a definite change. And one of the subtle little problems with digital inputs, uh, and I don't know if anyone here has come across them, is to do with, I've got a card here, yep, here we are. Here's a typical discrete digital DC input module. And uh, Carol, if you can confirm, you can see that with me circling around it. Uh, there's been no comms dropout. Um, you'll see one of the, obviously the issues is you typically could use a voltage, say zero to 24 volts. Great, thanks Carol for that vote of confidence. 24 volt DC and when it's on and you've got your positive input and everyone's happy. And when this is closed, bingo, input goes on. You could also have the situation where I've seen it, where you've actually got the input off, off, um, but um, uh, what could happen is that you've got enough leakage current coming through, and these are often due to proximity detectors having a low resistance. So you have enough leakage coming through to actually bias your input to be on even though the output voltage is off. So watch out for subtle little problems like that. Watch out for them, big issue. Um, the other little issue here, by the way, just to protect your cards, some of the cheaper cards oops, don't have optical isolation. It's a very good, oops, very good um, investment to have optical isolation. Just make sure your cards have optical isolation for the inputs. So leakage current can be an issue. Um, digital outputs, obviously check the power supply to the module, and obviously with digital inputs and outputs, you have the thing called sync and source. If it's a digital input and it's a sync module, then the current flows into the input. So you supply the plus 24 volt DC, flows into your card, that's called a sync input. You could also have source inputs as well, but I'm not going to talk about those. So here again, check the fuses, check the digital outputs are on and off. Uh, best to force them on and off and see what's going on. And again, always test the load. 
uh, test your outputs with load rather than open circuit. Why? Because they may not deliver the current that you require, and that's where the problem occurs. So make sure you test them under load. Just checking the output on doesn't necessarily mean there's no load that it actually does work in the real world. Um, in analog inputs, again, um, challenge here is to move your field clip device through the full range, 4 to 20 milliamps. 4 milliamps meaning zero, and 20 milliamps meaning 100%. Hook up a tran signal transmitter if you need to be absolutely sure. Uh, the few subtleties today, of course, is that everything today is heart or digital inputs, and as well as a, a profi bus or field bus or a highway addressable HART um, input where you've got a digital signal superimposed on an analog input. Analog outputs, obviously, again, force your output to a specific value and observe. Check the external wiring if there's a problem there. So, and one of the other little issues here, actually, by the way, um, with inputs, which caused me a bit of angst in the past, um, is with analog inputs. I don't know if anyone here has had a problem. Um, I spent many happy hours trying to tune an analog input um, in a, a mineral processing plant, and I just couldn't get the tuning parameters correct. What I found out, to my horror, was that the analog inputs were reading the signal correctly, but unfortunately, they had an aliasing problem. Has anyone heard hear about aliasing? Very subtle problem. What was happening was that the alias, I'll just write it down there, alias, my best script, alias. Basically, what was happening was that there was a variable speed drive in the plant, and there were enough harmonics on my analog input, induced onto the analog input lines, to cause the analog input card to see a different, when it was sampling the signal, to see a totally different signal. So tuning was a problem. How do we fix it? Well, we had to put signal conditioning on um, and obviously have remonstrate with the guys that put the variable speed drives in because they hadn't actually followed the correct um, standards and there was excessive harmonics. So a big problem that another life story which took me, made me rather aware of things such as aliasing, which I couldn't believe would happen on a, on a plant. That's where digital signal processing, you think there's no significance in the real world, actually has enormous significance. So those are interesting points. So remote troubleshooting, um, obviously just be aware of. Uh, today we're all doing remote troubleshooting, but watch out for network security, because if you have your plant hacked, obviously major problems. Um, just a few other little points here. Um, I just want to emphasize again, one of the things which is very unpredictable in any plant environment is obviously um, transients, spikes, electronic, electrical spikes going through the system. We always think about lightning or something like that, but there could just be an earth potential rise due to an electrical fault. So that could damage your input. So the trick is there, try and use fiber optics where possible. And obviously make sure you have good earth grounding uh, for your data comm systems between your racks. I've had a problem here uh, with a common mode voltage problem, CMV, which caused me great angst. Um, the system was very simply an RS422 set of remote racks connected back to my PLC, which was running over a distance of about 150, 200 meters. Um, but there was a problem with the RS-422, which is similar to RS-485, and in fact, the remote rack had an earth potential rise, so it wasn't at the same uh, earth, if we can call it earth, as the main PLC, and that caused the um, remote link to drop out. Uh, I'm sorry about that, Homza, hot mic, um, hot not. Yeah, we'll certainly give you the recording. Sorry about the sound and video. Um, is everyone else, can everyone else hear me? Maybe you can all give me a little, little pretty picture by uh, just collecting on your 
hand. If you look at my hand, just connect on it, click on it. And you can actually put your hand up. Yeah, smiley face, just to say hello, I'm happy. Can you all give me a smiley face? Maybe not. Um, Carol, maybe you can tell them how to do a smiley face. Over to you for a few seconds while I just take a quick break for a glass of water. Right, in the bottom left-hand uh, corner of the page, you have um, the text box, and to the right of that and slightly above it, there's uh, there are emoticons. There's a smiley face there. So if you can hear us clearly, if you can click on that, and then a smiley face will appear. Steve's one's got sunglasses on because obviously he's in sunny Perth. Um, if you can give us a smiley face, um, it will appear beside your name if you can hear us. That's it. We're getting a few few smiley faces. If you can hear us, you, if you can, uh, if you can just let us know by giving us a smiley face, and I'll hand back to Steve. Thanks very much, uh, Carol. Um, yes, yeah, so as Carol said, just give us a smiley face so we all know that you're happy. Um, I always worry that we've lost contact with everyone in the class. Srinivas, hopefully you can hear me. Can you give us a smiley face? If you there, can you hear us? Ah, oh, there's a smiley face on the nail. Srinivas is probably can't hear us. Anyway, thorny transients are an issue and um, just watch out. Um, we always use uh, shielding for our copper cables, but often there's potential problems there. So just be very wary of, of um, spikes or transients going through your plant. So really one of the most important things is either use fiber optics or some form of optical isolation to get rid of those spikes going through. So if you have a spike coming through, it will be stopped at that point there. So fiber optic really important um, to try and avoid these sort of problems. And as I said, often you'll find that that earth point there is not the same as that earth point there. So again, be wary of these little issues. It can be a minefield out there. So the other little point I'd like to make is when you were using PLCs, if you've got any doubt about your outputs, where they're connected to, disconnect immediately. Test with dummy equipment, not a one megawatt, megawatt bore mill. The results can be catastrophic. So just now, just to talk, the last second section is just to talk about SCADA systems. I know time is always tight. Um, I just really want to focus on SCADA systems now and just obviously look at it from the point of view of a data communication link. So really, it stands for supervisory control and data acquisition. It's not just software and hardware, but it's a complete control system. So there's a few interpretations of what SCADA is. It could be a wide area network uh, connected together with remote RTUs, remote terminal units, and the main control station. Or um, it could be a window into the process. So there are different interpretations. But what I'd really want to just a focus on is the communication link between the PLC and the SCADA system. Whether that's called an RTU or PLC doesn't matter. I just really want to look at this link there. That's of interest to me at this point. So really, you could have RTUs or remote terminal units, which is like a PLC. And often is a PLC, and here's a typical example of the SCADA system uh, with connections with radio, as you can see a radio link there. Um, and then Internally here, you've got, most in most cases, a Ethernet or um, RS-485 link, perhaps. Um, and here's a typical, another typical example of client server for SCADA systems. Uh, for the PLC system, pretty complicated. But underpinning all these SCADA systems, or the interface to the PLC is industrial communication protocols. Now, obviously, this presentation is not about 
industrial communications, but I just want to highlight some of the issues. So first of all, hopefully you're not using RS-232, which has been a cause of much pain and suffering. Most of the time we'll be using at least RS-485 for the simple communication links. Uh, for example, you could be running with Modbus over RS-485. So this is a typical example of a 485 link. Let me just go back to it. Here's a typical example of a 485 link. Now, one of the challenges of this 485 link is always be wary of your uh, common line there. Make sure that is connected to all your devices. If there's a problem here with earthing, you may find uh, it doesn't perform as you would like it. So really the idea is to keep this common line to keep your common mode voltage within the parameters of all the slave devices. So earthing, very important, and some common line to connect them together. These RS-485 are very sensitive to a voltage rise, common mode voltage rise, so the earthing has to be top notch. One of the challenges also with these links is always make sure you've got your terminating resistors there, um, at the ends of the cable to prevent reflections. Sometimes they've come off, I've noticed on some devices. And as I said, if you can, at all costs, try and avoid using 485 and go for a good old fiber optic link. Now, just to briefly talk about Modbus, this is one of the protocols used. You always hear Modbus running over 485. Modbus, very easy to use. Um, some of the challenges with Modbus um, are if you get um, any errors in the link due to interference, you could find your messages are just ignored. But very easy to use and very easy to troubleshoot in Modbus. Very well defined, extremely good standard. Um, so very just to talk about troubleshooting of these links, just make sure the components uh, are not removed while the system is powered up. Um, when you're removing components under load, you could cause a few issues. And obviously, um, just as far as the radio system is concerned, make sure the antenna system is not disconnected unless a dummy load has been installed. Otherwise, you may damage your radio power amplifier. There's a few little issues on the side. Just some discussion here about RTUs, and I'm not going to worry too much about that. Um, the operator station. Um, really, as I said, the critical thing is the, um, if you see, for example, a few problems such as operator terminal locks up intermittently, you may find it's due to some um, electrical interference or a spike that's come through the system. Or if your throughput drops off dramatically, you may find also that it's due to noise or interference on your communication link, which is causing multiple retries of your protocol messages. So that's just a quick summary from me. Uh, just if I can just summarize what we've spoken about. One is we've spoken about the PLC. And as I said, 80% of your problems with the PLC are generally external to the PLC. So it's to do with the field wiring. Um, internally, if you see multiple inputs failing, it's often something to do with uh, the internals of the PLC, but very unusual, very unusual. Um, a few problems I haven't really spoken about PLCs I've had in the past um, are overheating of components. For example, you're up in a very hot desert area and the components overheat, your input cards overheat. Strange things often happen at that point uh, with your inputs and outputs. So obviously avoid uh, putting stressing your PLC. Um, and the other issue with PLCs is when they connect them to the SCADA system, try at all costs to use some sort of fiber optic connection. Fiber will get rid of a lot of those strange, unexplained problems. At all costs, make sure that your earthing is top-notch for your PLC system. If you neglect that little issue, you will pay the price with intermittent failures. Intermittent failures are some of the worst giant killers with um, working with PLCs. So that's all from me. I just want to thank you very much for attending this session. Um, We'll give you a full recording and obviously all the notes. There's a few chapters which uh, Carol will get out to you guys, uh, you and the other 600 guys that wanted the recordings. Um, just want to thank you very much. Carol, over to you.
Thanks, Steve. You're, uh, you'd like to know, hopefully like to know that your, uh, your sound was perfect throughout the whole, uh, the whole session. So that, uh, that was very good. Um, as Steve said, we'll be sending a recording out to everybody. Uh, it may take uh, up to 10 days because we have to convert it into the right format uh, for you. But uh, you will receive a link to, uh, to be able to access the recording, the slides and the extra materials that Steve has put together for you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Carol, for supervising all this. I really appreciate it. Uh, any any comments or questions, you're welcome to send them to any comments or questions. Email them to tech. That's my email, idc-online.com. You know, it's got to get this right here. Yeah? .com and uh, any queries or comments. But hopefully the attached notes will also give you a lot more detailed information. So thank you very much, Emil, also for attending. I uh, really appreciate it. And um, good to have no comms dropouts or anything strange with the internet, like a uh, computer failure or something like that, which we had in the past. So I look forward to the